I get a lot of questions about David Cronenberg. And the question I'm asked more than any other is, what happens if you build a $3.5 million house before the blueprint is finished? So this week, I'll finally answer that question. We'll examine David Cronenberg's film Scanners from 1981 in this week's Analytical Filmmaking Analysis of the Week. By the way, this is a segment from the Carl King Podcast. If you enjoy this video, remember to like and subscribe and send us burritos. This week's analytical filmmaking analysis of the week is David Cronenberg's Scanners from 1981, screenwrited and directed by David Cronenberg himself when he was 38 years old. We are going to examine this film, and at the end, I'll give you five tasty screenwriting leftovers for your mental Tupperware. Now, for context, according to the internet, this was Cronenberg's seventh feature-length fiction film. Although he had made short films, documentaries, and television throughout the 60s and 70s. All this to say that Scanners was far from being David Cronenberg's first film. And it shows a less developed artist but still contains strong hints of the filmmaker he would soon become. Because Scanners was only two years before Videodrome, and that's remarkable because of how much his Type 2 creativity developed in that time. By comparison, Scanners is less rich in terms of ambiguity, abstraction, subtlety, nonlinearity, and all the other things we look for in the later Type 2 Cronenberg films. And if you don't know what the heck I'm talking about by type 1 and type 2, please see episode 57 called Are There Two Types of Art? in which I lay out a whole system with seven dimensions. Now in his defense, according to the internet, Scanners had major problems during production. Cronenberg called it one of his most difficult films to make because in order to take advantage of some sort of government tax deal, he had to begin filming before the sets or even the script was finished. And that is a bad situation. As a reminder, or for those who don't realize this, the script is not just the words the actors say. It's the setting, the characters, the story, the scenes, the structure, the theme, it's the complete recipe for cooking the film. And in this analogy, Cronenberg had to start cooking before knowing what he was making, before the recipe was even fully written. And that's a big risk, most likely leading to a mess. So let's start by talking about that opening scene. When I start watching a film, I always want to know, one, what's the opening scene slash teaser? Two, how long is it? And three, how long does it take for the first dialogue to happen? Well, the film starts with a continuous shot of the main character, Cameron Vale, walking into a mall food court. And he sits down and eats a hot dog. And this woman sitting nearby says to her friend, I've never seen something so disgusting in all my life. I don't know why they let creatures like that in here. And I was puzzled. I wasn't sure what was disgusting about him or why she was calling him a creature like that. So maybe this is an alternate world Cronenberg is setting up and I just haven't learned the rules of that alternate world yet. And when those two women speak, it is dialogue, but it's more like their distant commentary. The volume of it is very low and they're not right next to him, so we're experiencing the scene from his point of view. And the bulk of that opening scene is four minutes of visual storytelling. And aside from being confused about why he was being judged so harshly, I was on board, thinking this is definitely going to be a type two film. And then at five minutes, 25 seconds, we get another scene where 
a guy named Dr. Ruth, speaks to Cameron Vale for the first time. And this feels like the first official dialogue. You're 35 years old, Mr. Vale. Why are you such a derelict, such a piece of human junk? And I thought, wow, that is another harsh thing to say. And that was actually the point where it occurred to me that Cameron Vale was supposed to be homeless. And I had to go back to the previous scene and realized that the hot dog he ate was left behind on the table by someone else. But by today's standards, he looked totally normal. His appearance definitely didn't scream derelict or piece of human junk to me. And then Dr. Ruth fires off some exposition. The answer is simple. You're a scanner, but you don't realize it. That has been the source of all your agony. But I will show you now that it can be a source of great power. And then he turns and says, let them in. And he's referring to a bunch of people who come into the room so Cameron can read their minds. And this was the first point where the dialogue jumped out at me as being too heavy handed and very type one. I might have trimmed it down to simply say, the answer's simple. And then he pauses and then says, let them in. And I'd leave the audience to fill in that blank. Anyway, then we get a long montage of Cameron strapped in a bed, having seizures and overwhelmed by hearing people's thoughts. And it goes on a long time. It's pretty melodramatic. And it did remind me of how I feel in crowds with some of my autistic tendencies. Still, even with the cacophony of people's thoughts, there's very little actual dialogue in the first 10 minutes Scripts are typically one page per minute, but if you were to add all of this dialogue up, so far there's maybe one page of dialogue at most. And a typical writer might have filled that same space with 10 pages of dialogue. Or if you're Aaron Sorkin, 20 pages. And that's nothing against Aaron Sorkin because I love what he does. My point is, these scenes are slow and deliberate and building tension. It's making us curious. Following that, there's the iconic scene with the exploding head and then a scene with an exploding car. And up until now, we discover the premise of the story without having to hear too much talking about it. We just see it all happening. But then the film's style takes a very sharp turn towards type one because up until this point, there had been sparse dialogue heavy visual storytelling, and lots of mystery. At 17 minutes, 37 seconds, there's a nearly five-minute boardroom meeting with a bunch of executives for a company called Consec. And it is heavy exposition. A group of men sit around a table and talk, telling the audience what we just saw for the past nearly 18 minutes but they don't really need to do that. We already know that there are deadly telepaths called scanners. We just watch them going around killing people, making their heads explode. That scene seemed to bring the film's pacing and its intrigue to a halt because the story just stops. Facts are delivered in the form of questions and answers, and that lasts until about 22 minutes, 13 seconds. Towards the end of the scene, the guy in charge says to Dr. Ruth, what do you suggest, doctor? And Dr. Ruth answers, contact a scanner who is as of yet unknown to the underground, convert him to our cause, and then send him out to infiltrate the underground. So there it is at 21 minutes, seven seconds. The plot is stated. We know the mission we're about to watch. But then, just a couple minutes later, at 23 minutes, 14 seconds, we get another exposition scene where Dr. Ruth explains to Cameron Vale what a scanner is. And I'm going to guess that this exposition was repeated because of that writing the script during filming problem. And who knows what order these scenes were actually written or shot in or how it needed to be assembled to make sense during editing. Two minutes into that scene, at 25 minutes, 18 seconds, Cameron Vale asks, how do you know these things? 
And Dr. Ruth answers, it's my profession. And the scene ends. But 30 seconds earlier, Dr. Ruth had just told him point blank, I'm a psychopharmacist by trade specializing in the phenomenon of scanners. So why did Cameron Vale ask him, how do you know these things? Well, possibly because the writing of the script was hurried or because they were solving a bigger problem in the edit by putting that line at the end of the scene. And as an editor, I can relate. As David Lee Roth said, I ain't complaining. You do the best with what you got. And for most of the rest of the film, it continues in that type one style. We get on the nose dialogue like, come on, we've got to get out of here when they're in a car that's on fire. And come on, let's get out of here when they're being chased by bad guys. And those lines could have been left out entirely if you wanted to make it more type two. And the focus switches to the aspect of the corporate conspiracy rather than digging deeper into the premise of telepathy. The story becomes physical rather than psychological. External instead of internal. It's driven by the plot rather than by the characters. And that's okay, but it's very type one. And at this point, I began to wonder if we were to remove the fantasy and psychic powers element of the film, would the human story itself be compelling? And I think that's a good exercise because the ability to scan is mostly used from that point on as a means of combat. So it may as well have been guns or swords or even fists. And rather than being woven into the characters or explored on deeper levels, it's more of a surface element. And that's why it can be a good idea to build on a solid foundation of other storytelling elements and not just the fun eye candy. Now, towards the end of the story, Cameron is able to dial into the corporation's computer modem and merge his nervous system with its analog tapes, attempting to erase them. And I'm not sure how his telepathic ability suddenly expanded to also apply to computers. And there doesn't seem to be consistency to the magic here. And that's another thing you want to consider the rules of the fantasy world. What can the powers do and what can they not do? And those limits can actually help you make decisions about the story. All production difficulties considered, we ended up with a type one, but that is, in my own totally subjective opinion, not what David Cronenberg does best. So here are five tasty screenwriting leftovers for your mental Tupperware. Number one, get that screenplay locked down before production begins. Number two, decide if you're making a type one or a type two, and try not to shift between them drastically as the story progresses. Number three, if there are elements of magic, determine the rules. What can the magic do and what can it not do? Number four, as an exercise, remove all of those fantasy elements and ask, do you still have a compelling human story beyond your fantasy elements decoration. And number five, if you're David Cronenberg, do whatever the heck you want because your next film is Videodrome. So since I honestly can't complain about anything David Cronenberg does, I gave this film five out of five stars on Letterboxd. Okay, that's it for this week's analytical filmmaking analysis of the week. If you like this video, support the creation of more by joining my Patreon for $1 or $5 a month. That's patreon.com slash carlking.